So hello, welcome to today's class. Um, we're about to start the ninth chapter. Uh, and one of the things I said early on is that the first four chapters is officially physics one, the second two chapters is physics two, and the last four chapters is chemistry. And that's what we're starting up now. Um, this is going to be kind of interesting, the next two chapters, because um, they're kind of both chemistry and physics. In fact, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about here is things that physicists discovered, but is the basis of chemistry. So this is kind of a crossover right now between physics and chem. But we will be getting into straight up chemistry as we progress in it. Now, before I get into chapter nine, which is called The Atom and is all about atoms, um, I do want to talk a little bit about last week's exam. So um, on the exam, the highest grade was a 99%, with a, the average being a 75.6 full, which is a little higher than exam one. Um, it seems to have gone pretty well. Um, the breakdown of grades looked like this, where six of you got between 90 and 100, which is pretty amazing. Um, but that is the breakdown of the exam grades. And with that, that makes the grades in the class look like this. Well, the average in the class is a 79.7, which is real high. So that's cool. Um, this is before I graded the Lab 10 uh, Ohm's Law Lab, but that should have only had small changes because I did I made this Thursday after grading the exam. Um, but that's the general breakdown. Um, although numbers doesn't matter as much as letter grades. This is the letter grades in the class right now. Um, so kind of a peak at B plus, but pretty flat. Um, but that is the setup of where we are at now. Now, any questions about the exam or the class in general before I start talking about chapter nine? Okay. Um, I do have one other announcement, which it's kind of funny because the last time I made this announcement, basically identical, was after the first exam. Um, I am going to have to shorten an office hour. Uh, oops, that is actually wrong. Um, I'm going to cut the second half of my office hour on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it's normally three to five, instead, I'm going to do three to four. It's because there's an open session for new dean candidates. Um, so I am going to show them that office hour, but there's no homework or lab due this week. So I figure it shouldn't be that big of an issue. Um, but just so you know, I'm doing that. Okay. Okay. Let's talk atoms. Atoms are everything. All metal, everything is just made up of atoms. The, from you to the, your computer, to the air you're breathing. All matter is just a collection of atoms put together in different ways. Now, we'll often talk about various types of atoms. When we talk about the type of an atom, we normally define it by what element it is. So you, when you talk about an element, something of a pure element, like if I say I have a piece of gold, that piece of gold, everything is made up with a special type of atom that matches gold. That atoms and combinations of atoms is how we make up everything with each element being a specific type of atom with a specific build. Now, you know, things have existed a lot longer than we've known what the hell an atom is. And so I'm gonna go a little historical with this, going through the different models of the atom and how they were discovered. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the modern version of the atom, which I will not get to today, this will be in class Wednesday, I talk about the modern version of the atom, is stupidly complicated. Um, going back to the slide one I had, um, this is if it doesn't shock you, you don't understand it. But the first person to think that the atom exists was a man named John Dalton. In 1803, Dalton proposed that matter is not continuous. Before that, except for originally Aristotle, who Aristotle thought, earth, well, ancient Greeks thought everything was made up of four elements, earth, wind, water, fire, and Aristotle added to add ether, earth, wind, water, fire, ether. Um, 
and that was the original thought of how matter could be made up that then everyone kind of stopped talking that idea and forgot that idea and went to it's just continuous but john dalton said that things weren't continuous they could be broken up that if you have a hunk of metal it's made up of individual pieces or atoms and he said each element is comprised of tiny indivisible indestructible particles the general idea is an atom could not be split that it was the basis of everything you could never break an atom into pieces it was later found not to be true by two men thompson and rutherford we'll come back to them um and really the only thing in that first sentence that's correct is tiny they are indivisible they are indestructible but they are tiny so that's something and what he said is all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. Now, this also is now known not to be 100 percent true, They're not necessarily identical, but they do have the same properties and are very, very similar in certain ways. He also thought that atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. And this is still what we believe today. And that compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. And atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. For example, two hydrogens and oxygen is water. Two hydrogens and two oxygens is hydrogen peroxide. There's a very big difference between the two. One you need to drink to live, the other will kill you. This picture right here of the methane molecule is how it actually Dalton said methane looked like. He said methane was one carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms, which we know still that is what methane is we still believe that to be what methane is now and so some of these ideas we still hold to mostly the more macro versions aka atoms of different elements can form compounds compounds contain atoms in whole number ratios and atoms can combine a more than one ratio to form different compounds the rest of this not so much we no longer believe that they're indivisible. We no longer believe they're indestructible. And they're not necessarily identical. They're more similar. Uh, that gets into the idea of um, neutrons, which we'll get to in a few slides. Now, this was, as I said, around 1803. And that was what people said the atom was. For about 100 years, you see, in the 1800s, people started realizing that if you pass electricity through hydrogen gas, um, you'd get charged particles out of it. And that if you just shock hydrogen gas, you'd get this positive part and some negative part. And people actually learned that they could get the mass of that positive part and the negative. Excuse me. They could get the mass of the positive part and the negative part. And what people started thinking was, if we can shoot electricity through hydrogen, and if we can separate a positive charge piece and a negative charge piece, we must be able to break an atom. It must be divisible. And a new part model of the map, uh, the new model of the atom was proposed in 1903 by a man named J.J. Thompson. And he said that all atoms are made up of protons and electrons. Well, a proton has a charge of plus one, an electron has a charge of negative one. Now, fun fact on this, we now know from last chapter, the charge for a proton to be 6.11 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, the charge of an electron to be negative 6.11 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, moving forward in chemistry, we're not going to really work in coulombs. We're just going to talk about most elementary charge, where the charge for a proton is plus one, or the charge of an electron is negative one. That's not in coulombs. If you want it in coulombs, you have to use those values of the so I said 6.11. 6.11 is the wrong number. Uh, 1.6 times 10 negative 19. Um, yeah, proton is 1.6 times 10 negative 19 coulombs. Uh, electron is negative 1.6 times 10 negative 19 coulombs. Sorry, wrong number by memory. But um, we're not, for now, we're just going to say it's a plus one, negative one, where the units there are elementary charge. And what he said, is that since a proton has a lot more mass than an electron, he actually was able to figure out the mass of a proton was 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. And an electron was 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. Since a proton is so much heavier than an electron, he said the model of the atom is what is commonly called the plum pudding model. Now, I've personally never had plum pudding, but what I gather plum pudding is from this model more than anything else, is that it's kind of a gelatinous goop with hard hunks in it. And that's what he said the model was. He said the proton is this gelatinous goo. 
and electrons floated around inside of it as hard hunks. And that each electron has the same as a, the charge negative one. And the protons add up to have a charge that matched. And that the electrons are just randomly distributed throughout the protons, like inside the protons, just based off these mass differences. Um, he did not mention neutrons, and we'll come back to neutrons. Now, this was, in, as I said, in 1903. This model didn't last very long. In 1911, this model was disproven and corrected by a man named Rutherford. And Rutherford, this is a fun bit here, was J.J. Thompson's student. So J.J. Thompson's like, guys, I figured out the atom. And then he graduated a student, and the second his student left his lab, he's like, guys, my boss was wrong. This is the model of the atom. Um, he was originally a sheep farmer, which is kind of an interesting thing that he's now like made the model of the atom after that. But what he identified is that it's the plum pudding model is not correct. What it is, is that an atom is made up of a nucleus and that this nucleus has uh, protons all in the center or condensed in one spot. And that the electrons orbit it, just like how the planets orbit the sun at random radii. And actually his student, a man named James Chadwick, discovered that there's also neutrons in the nucleus, and that the nucleus is a mixture of protons and neutrons, where neutrons have no charge, but about the same mass of a proton. Now, this is closer to what we believe today. We still we do believe today of this idea of a nucleus, which has protons and neutrons. And we still believe today that the electrons orbit the nucleus. What we don't believe necessarily is this at random spots that it's all random. We now know it to be a little more structured than that. So I'll come back to the idea. Now, how he figured out this structure, how he figured out that there was a nucleus with protons and neutrons shoved together and electrons at a higher radius, what he had did was he took a very, very thin piece of gold foil and shot alpha particles at it. Um, alpha particles are a type of radiation. They consist of two neutrons and two protons shoved together, though that wasn't known at the time. And what they found is when they shot electrons at this gold foil, most of it went straight through, like nothing happened. They just went, phew, and just, yeah, well, I shouldn't use red on this. This went straight through, undeflected. But every once in a while, some of the alpha particles would deflect and go shooting off at large angles, like they hit something. You see, this didn't make sense to Rutherford with his boss's model, because the idea is, is that the proton was this gelatinous goo. And if it's just a gelatinous goo, things should fly right through it. And also, the electrons he thought was super tiny. And if they were super tiny, you'd probably never hit them. And if the Thompson model, the atom, was correct, when you shot the alpha particles at the plum pudding model, they should have always all gone straight through. But we sometimes deflected. Since we sometimes deflected, it means we sometimes hit something hard to deflect it. And the basis of that was the idea of the nucleus, that the deflection was when the alpha particles hit the nucleus and bounced off of it. And so that is... In its simplest form is still the present model of the atom. There is a nucleus made up of neutrons and protons. Uh, neutrons and protons have the same mass of each other. Neutrons have a charge zero. Protons have a charge plus one. And electrons orbit this nucleus, each one with a charge negative one. Well, once again, I'm going to make some corrections. All of the models of the atom since then are all dealing with how the electrons orbit. From um, Rutherford's idea that it was random to the Bull model, which we're going to get to, which says set radii, to the present model of the atom, which is, dear God, it is so much more complicated than that. Now, to explain why we no longer think electrons orbit a separate radius, before I can explain that, I need to completely change topics for a little bit. 
so I can get make sure you understand some ideas. And then I'm going to come back to why we now know that Rutherford was wrong. The electrons do not have randomized radiuses, but very set radiuses. And the basis of that is the dual nature of light. Here's the general idea. An object at any given temperature emits electromagnetic radiation. That's what radiation is, as we talked about in chapter six or seven. I forget which. It's called thermal radiation. And what people had realized as far back as then is that the temperature of the object affects the intensity and wavelength produced. Anything at room temperature is glowing. This ruler is glowing but only in the infrared. If you heat something up more, it's it, the light it emits will become brighter and will shift towards the visible. If you heat something up enough, it'll glow red. If you heat it up even more, it'll eventually glow white, where white, remember, is the entire spectrum, where you're seeing all the colors at once. If you keep heating something up past white, it'll turn blue. Because when you turn blue, you are going off the end of the spectrum. Now, in reality, all things of any temperature produce all wavelengths. It's just, you know, this guy's producing so little in the visible, you don't notice it. This red hot thing is producing a little bit of blue, but it's only a little bit of blue. It's mostly in the red range. Um, this white light is producing all of the visible wavelengths, as you're seeing it like that. Uh, this also is, by the way, why different stars look different colors. Uh, different stars, some look more bluish, some look more reddish. It's just what temperature they are. That Betelgeuse in Orion looks red because it's not as hot as Rigel, also in Orion, which looks more blue. Interesting fact here. Now, the reason people thought this was true is they thought it was because accelerated charged particles called radiation. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying the view of temperature we had before, right? The temperature was how fast things were vibrating. And what they said is, if something is vibrating slowly, it'll have so much radiation caused. If something vibrates quickly, it'll have more radiation off. And people have made some experimental data for it. And they said, okay, at 2000 Kelvin, something will glow with a peak between one, 100, sorry, one and two micrometers wavelength. At 3000 Kelvin, it'll have a peak around one micrometer cooler needles. But with that, it has a little bit of red. It'll start glowing a little red. At 4000 Kelvin, you see a lot more red, where this rainbow stripe on that is just to represent the visible wavelengths. And so it's showing a lot more colors. It'll look a little yellowish oranges because we got some green and blue to balance the red. That as you increase the temperature, what will happen is the peak in wavelengths emitted would shift towards blue and also get brighter and brighter, which is why low te lower temperatures, it's all infrared, higher temperatures, it's red, higher, higher temperatures, it's blue. But here's the thing. All of the, what they did is they took this data and they said, we got data, let's just make equations to fit it. And all the equations they made to fit that data said, logically, this should keep going. That the hotter something gets, the more the wavelength shifts. And if you make something hotter and hotter and hotter, it would, the light emitter would get more and more um, vibrant and keep shifting. Well, eventually, if it keeps shifting this way, it should shift out of the visible range, should all become ultraviolet and would shift without limit. And so they took this data and they said that this data plotted would be this orange line on the bottom right graph. That the hotter something gets, it should just get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And this is the idea of the ultraviolet catastrophe. Because what it says is this is true. When something gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it would basically get more and more and more power, more and more electrical energy. And eventually get like infinite power, which is a little crazy. And experimentally, people found when you made something get hotter and hotter and hotter, it did shift further and further and further blue up to a point. And up to that point, it went back down. This is the blue graph of this experimental data. And it didn't happen. There was no ultraviolet catastrophe. There was a limit. To which people said, why did this happen? Everyone went, oh, no. 
and no one could explain. Okay, so any questions here? Because I'm getting into, I'm literally about to get into quantum physics. This is not the world's most simple subject. I'm going to try to explain it as base as I can, but please let me know if I lose you. All right. What happened is a man named Max Planck came around and he looked at the data, looked at what the experimental data was and made a formula that matched it. And this is one of my um, more favorite of how physicists sometimes work. He said, hey guys, if we say everything emits a certain amount of energy and that energy is NHF and that what it is is the frequency of light emitted is a constant, which he called Planck's constant, as he made the equation, he can make the constant, times n, where n is any integer. If we say this, we can say the energy related to the thermal energy, aka what wavelengths are emitted and whatnot. Um, it matches the data. And people went, okay, why does it why does this equation work? And he goes, I have no fucking idea. It's just the, it works. Let's use this equation, it works. And people were like, but why does it work? And he's just like, Meh. Who knows? It works. Now, this was the this idea, though, said that the energy was quantized. What it means by that is the energy could not be any value it wanted. The energy had to be set values on integer, integer values, since n could only be an integer. And this idea that energy was quantized is a very big step that made everyone revisit the way they looked at this physics slash chemistry. This is kind of both topics. And here's the idea, this n being an integer, what that means is let's say you have a ball and you put it on a slope. If you had a ball on a slope, it could be anywhere on that slope at any height, assuming it's not going to just instantly roll down. But if you instead put a ball on steps, it can, ex it can only exist in certain spots. It can, exist, it can exist on this step or this step, but it will never exist between them. And that was his idea here, that the light went as step. The energy of the light could be HF or 2HF or 3HF or so on, but it could never be 1.5HF or 2.678HF or pi HF. It could only be set integer values. And that the all light had an exact amount of energy of NHF, that that was the energy light had. And if you said that light has the energy of NHF, and I'm skipping a lot here because I don't want to get fully into quantum physics, but if you say that is true, mathematically it worked out that the ultraviolet catastrophe would not exist. Any questions though? Okay. I'm going to do another side tangent. I got to put a lot of things together. So meanwhile, model of the atom. We had radius doesn't matter. That's what we're trying to get to. We had ultraviolet catastrophe. This equation, Planck's equation of E equals NHF, solved it. At the same time, there was something else people discovered. At the very end of the 1800s, at the end of the 19th century, people realized that if you shine light on a metallic surface, you could create a circuit. And that the setup is basically as shown in the right side. That what it is, is if you take two metal plates, uh, one called the emitter, one called the collector. And on these two metal plates, if you put a wire between them, and ignore this variable power supply for now, um, I'm going to come back to that. Actually, I don't know if I will at this level. I can't remember off the top of my head, but ignore it for now. If you put a wire going from the emitter to the collector, right now it's a not complete circuit. It's just a wire hooked up to two hunks of metal. Nothing would happen. But if you shined light on the emitter, a circuit would start going. You would read a voltage and a current as the electricity went through. And if a current went through, that means electrons were moving. And this was known as the photoelectric effect. What people started doing is they'd hook up a variable power supply pointing the opposite direction. And that's what you're gonna see in an upcoming lab. And the general idea is if you put a variable power supply on it, um, you can adjust the power supply to figure out what voltage is needed to have no circuit, and that can tell you the voltage of the electrons moving. And it basically said, in the dark, there was no current. But when you shine the light, there was a current, but only if the light had a set wavelength. See, not all light created the current. 
And what they found is that there was a minimum, sorry, a maximum wavelength. That if the light had a wavelength um, under a certain amount, you got a current. If the light's wavelength was higher than that amount, nothing happened. And what that amount is depended on what type of metal you used. Uh, side note, this idea of the photoelectric effect is a very commonly used thing. Uh, if you have an electric garage door, you have little sensors at the bottom. So if someone steps through, the garage door stops going down. That actually uses the photoelectric effect. What it is, or any automated door, like an automated door, like a um, grocery store that like open when you walk closer. What it is, it's shooting a beam of light, um, infrared that you can't see. And if you step in front of it, you block the beam of light. The second you block the beam of light, the circuit stops because there's no longer electricity going through. Um, so, so how photocells work. But in general, people understood this happened, but they couldn't explain how. No one understood why it only worked for certain wavelengths. And I'm going to actually switch back to frequency, because remember, for light, they're directly related. That for light, the speed of light is the frequency times the wavelength. And so what they said is you had to have a minimum frequency to work. And no one knew why. Um, they also knew that the kinetic energy didn't depend on the intensity of light. That no matter if it was bright light or dim light, made no difference. And that didn't make any sense. They did know that how the kinetic energy of the particles, how much current you had, did depend on the frequency. That as you increase the frequency, you increase the current. But they didn't know why it didn't change how bright the light was, or why it happened even if the light was really, really dim. And in 1905, someone gave the answer to why and became very famous for it, possibly the most famous of any physicist ever. And that would be Albert Einstein. This is what Albert Einstein became famous for. In 1905, he said he worked out why the photoelectric effect worked. Um, he got a Nobel Prize for this. Um, and there's a whole bunch of craziness with Einstein in like a three-year period. Um, within those few years, he also worked out relativity and a whole bunch of stuff. He basically decided to review the entire way we viewed physics. And most of his ideas have been proven true since then. And what he said is, we as, or them as physicists, knew that light was a wave. It could travel through space. It's why polarization works. It's why diffraction works. We talked about light was as a wave a few chapters ago. So I said moves through space. Let's come back to that. It's why polarization works. Why diffraction works. The thing is, if light was a wave, it can't travel through space. And so what people said is that space was filled with some liquid called the luminous ether. And some people went and tried to prove the luminous ether existed. And all they did was prove it didn't exist, which kind of pissed everyone off at the time, because what the fuck? And what Einstein said is that light itself is quantized and consists of particles. That light is not a wave, but a particle. And uh, later on, someone coined the phrase photon. And the general idea is when you shine light at something, it's not just a wave going, an electromagnetic wave, but little hunks of things that fly off. And that Planck's equation of HF, what it is, is that the energy emitted by light is NHF because each photon has an energy of HF. And the N comes from just how many photons you have. You have two photons, it's two HF. Three photons, three HF. Each individual photon, though, has an energy of HF. And that energy is proportional to frequency. Um, the lower the wavelength, the low, the higher the energy. Red has low frequency, high wavelength. It's taking real big steps when you want to look at it this way, and therefore is doing low energy. But this blue little guy has to use a lot of energy to keep up since everyone travels at the same speed. That's going to be high energy. So high frequency or low wavelength or like blue is high energy. Red, which is high wavelength, low frequency, is low energy. And Einstein said, let's say this is true. Let's say light is a particle. If this is true, then all of our issues, we can explain them. Why no electron emitted below a threshold frequency set by the material? What he said is emitted electrons are made by the absorption of the photon. 
So the energy of the photon must be greater than a certain amount, which he defined as the work function, where the work function can be found as the Planck's constant times the cutoff frequency, where the cutoff frequency is the lowest frequency allowed. Why intensity doesn't matter? Intensity isn't part of the equation, so it doesn't matter. While the max kinetic energy increase of increasing frequency, because when you increase the frequency, you increase the energy. So that matches. Why does low intensity not matter? Because it doesn't really matter. It's just wavelength and frequency. It just happily happens when photons hit. Okay, any questions there? A uh, quick example problem before I get further into this idea. Um, what it means is we can find the energy of a photon of light. Let's say we have a photon of red light. Red light has a frequency of about 5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. If I say, what is the energy of that photon? The energy of the photon is Planck's constant times frequency. I'm dropping the N here because N is for multiple photons. One photon, you don't need. And Pl the H in this equation, once again, is Planck's constant. It is a constant. It has just has this value. It is and always will be 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. And so the energy of one photon of red light will just be that number times the frequency. There you go. There's the energy. Now, this is weird because i'm saying light is not a wave as we understand physics there is two ways things can exist wave and particle a particle has mass and can physically move a wave is the movement of energy without the movement of things and einstein said hey guys i can make everything work if light is a particle and not a wave but if light's not a wave polarization cannot exist diffraction cannot exist and so light had to be a wave. But if light's a particle, that explains the photoelectric effect and how it travels through space. And this introduces the dual nature of light. What Einstein postulated is light works as both a particle and a wave. It's not really either one, but it's both. And that it's something else that we don't understand. We don't have a model for. But the nice thing is, is you can say in some instances, let's treat like light as if it's a particle. In some instances, you can say, let's treat light as if it's a wave. And it'll work either way. Light has frequency and wavelength because it's a wave. Light has energy because it's a particle. And actually what it boils down to is light acts like a wave whenever it needs to be. There are certain tests you can do to prove light's a wave and it'll pass it every single time. Light is also a particle whenever it needs to be, and it will act like a particle whenever, if you do certain tests, every single time. That light can do both. Now it gets worse. We're going to talk about this on Wednesday, but it's now realized that all particles are waves and um, and and metal which means we don't actually fully understand what matter is, that whether something's a wave or a particle is as of now beyond our understanding, that we don't really get it. But what we we'll do is we'll just treat light, we'll treat all matter like a particle when it's useful for us, and we'll treat all, particle, all mass like a wave when it's useful to us. This is gonna get into the present model of the atom, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Questions there, because this is weird as fuck. Now, what I was trying to tell you about was the models of the atom. And so this idea that light can operate like a particle, and light has an energy of NHF, this did explain the photoelectric effect, but it also explained something else, something called atomic spectra. If you f fill a CO2 with gas, and it's done with hydrogen, so I'm going to talk about hydrogen, but this works for any gas, and you excite it, aka you put a shit ton of electricity through it, what will happen is it'll glow some color. And if you look at the 
if you look at the color it glows and separate them to wavelengths, you'll get discrete lines. For hydrogen, what you'll find is that hydrogen gas, when you put electricity through it, will emit light at 656 nanometers, 486 nanometers, 434 nanometers, and 410 nanometers. This is known as the emission spectra. And for each element, there will be set emission spectra when you excite it. That every time you accept hydrogen gas, you will see those lines. Now, traditionally, it'll just look like a weird purplish color. It's not till you look through a diffraction grating or a spectrometer, which is you're going to see on a different lab we're doing, that you'll see the individual lines or a prism. But when you excite the gas, it gets these lines. And this was another thing that people mathematically solved for where the lines should be. But why these lines were there, no one knew. Um, emission spectra is sometimes called atomic fingerprints. Um, each element produces its own unique lines. Um, and what it is, is that um, you can tell what an element is by where the lines are. In fact, um, uh, helium, and I think I might have this in the notes later on, but I'm going to say it now. Helium is so named because it's named after Helios, the god of the sun. Um, the reason why was helium was discovered on the sun before it was discovered on Earth, because people looked at the emission spectra of the sun and said, hey, guys, there's this line in the emission spectra we've never seen before. What? what, what? There must be another element there. Uh, and you can learn a lot by looking at something's emission spectrum. My research back when I did research was in spectroscopy, looking at emission spectra of stuff and looking at the emission spectra and seeing exactly what it looked like and discovering what the elements were and what they were doing. Um, it can also be done the other way. Oop, what just happened? I just skipped like six slides. It also can be done the other way. You could take white light and shine it on the gas and it'll absorb just at those set spectra, which is kind of an interesting thing. That if you take the gas cool and get wet light, instead you have absorption spectra at those lights at the exact same spots. Um, there's the helium thing I was just talking about. Um, but this general idea that each element, when excited, would emit at very set lines. And when not excited, would absorb at very set lines, being the exact same lines. Well, this was a kind of a questioning bit. And this was worked out by a man named Niels Bohr. In 1913, Niels Bohr said why. He made his own model of the atom. And what he said was, Rutherford's model, where we started, what seems like ages ago, that we had a nucleus and these electrons orbit at set radii. He said, you know what? There's no set radii. The electrons orbit at very, very set radiuses. It's not random. Each electrons orbit at a set radius. And he called those radiuses energy levels. And he said these energy levels were quantized following the same logic as Einstein and Max Planck, that these energy levels exist at set spots. And electrons can orbit at these energy levels, at these set spots, but nowhere else. Um, the basis of it had to do with angular momentum. This gets into some very complicated physics that we're not going to get into. But just know he said that the set radii, that it could have a radius in hydrogen of 0 0.053 nanometers or 0.212 nanometers, or 0.477 nanometers, but never in between those. And he defined his energy levels with integer numbers that he said he would find out the value of n, n being known as the principal quantum number. And n was just which energy level something was in. Well, n equals 1 is the lowest energy level and the smallest radius. N equals two is a bigger radius. N equals three is even bigger radius. Well, how far they were spaced was not uniform, that the spacing between the energy levels, um, the spacing gets bigger the further out you go. And he, well, he kind of made a lot of assumptions. He, once again, as these physicists seem to be want to do, didn't necessarily say why this was true, other than, hey, guys, let's assume this is true. If you assume this is true, that all electrons only exist at these set radii, if you assume this is all true, the math works out. And he said for a hydrogen atom, he worked out all the math. 
Now, a hydrogen atom is the simplest atom. It has one proton, one electron, and some number of neutrons that we're not going to worry about right now. But he said, if you make these assumptions, it works. And what works is going to be the atomic spectra I just talked about. That's what I'm going to. It's why I talked about it. But bear with me when I get there. I need to explain a few more things before I relate in the atomic spectra. Now, classical theory says that electrons accelerating they would have to lose energy. Where something moving in a circle is accelerating. We talked about this uh, with centripetal acceleration, right? If something's moving in a circle, it feels centripetal acceleration. If electrons are orbiting a nucleus, it's therefore accelerating, it would be losing energy. But both said electrons can only change energy when they change energy levels. You see, if something goes to a higher energy level, it has more energy and therefore gained energy. If something goes down to a lower energy level, it means it lost energy. It's why they'll call it energy levels, that each radius or energy level just says exactly how much energy an electron in it has. And Bohr said that's exactly how much energy the electron has. This is going to get into why the issues with the Bohr model and why we no longer believe it to be true today. Uh, side note, some of you in high school or before might have learned the Bohr model and be told that this is the model of the atom, this is true, this is fact. Um, it was actually brought, like, changed and edited about 10 years after it was made and has been believed to be 100% true since the early 1900s. Um, but it's this much, much, much simpler than what we know to be true. So it's so often taught as truth because it's a really good approximation. That if you claim it's true, the math kind of works. We just know it's more complicated than what's really happening. And what he said is that these energy levels could be viewed as a potential well. If you have a well and you want to take water out of it, it takes energy to lift the bucket out of the well. Right? If you want to lift water out of the well, you're going to have to. I think I wrote the same sentence twice, though. Takes energy to lift the bucket out of the well. I, wrote, I seriously wrote the same sentence right twice. Oh, no, it's just electron a second time. Never mind. I should not doubt myself. If you want to take the bucket out of a well, it takes energy. You're going to have to lift it up. Likewise, to, to remove an electron from an atom, it's going to take energy. It's the same idea. And he said that we're, to, we're going to define as an electron being infinitely far away from the nucleus as zero energy. And as it gets closer to the nucleus, it's going to have less energy. Where if zero is infinity, that means it gets closer. If the number is going down, it's going to go negative. And he said the ground state for hydrogen, the smallest amount of energy the electron can have, is negative 13.6 electron volts. Well, electron volts is just a unit of energy. Um, it is the amount of energy one electron has put through one volt of potential. And that if you go to higher energy levels, the energy um, the energy decreases. Sorry, as you go higher, the energy increases. I misspoke. That the energy increases. And so it's going to be less negative because it's increasing. And everything he said wants to be in the ground state, the ground state being the lowest possible energy level the electron can be in. Now, for hydrogen, the ground state is n equals 1. Um, for other more complicated atoms, the energy level will not be any, sorry, the ground state will not be n equals one, but that gets complicated. And he said the ground state is the lowest possible energy level. The excited state is anything else. And if you excite an electron, it jumps to a higher state. Well, you can excite an electron a whole bunch of ways, but if you basically add energy to an electron, it gets more energy, it'll jump to a higher energy level a higher energy level, which has more energy. Any questions here? I said, this is all still weird, but. Now, he mathematically solved for the radius of each energy level and the amount of energy an electron has in each energy level. The equations he used to solve this are really complicated, would take like an entire day to go through. So I'm just going to go straight to the conclusion. And what he said is the radius of each energy level is given by this equation. That the radius of each energy level is 0 0.053 nanometers times n squared, where n is the energy level. 
And this is only true for hydrogen. Keep in mind, this is only for hydrogen. And he went through and he used the logic of solving for something moving in a circle with conservation of angular momentum and all that stuff. And mathematically, he found this, which experimentally matched what people saw. And so this was kind of the proof that the Bull model was correct, is that the what mathematically said to be true matched what people really saw. Note this does give the radius in nanometers. He also mathematically solved for the energy of each energy level. Once again, he proved it mathematically and then compared it to the experimental data. And said so the energy of an electron in each energy level is negative 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared, where n is the energy level. And as I said before, one electron volt is the amount of energy one electron gets for a potential difference of one volt. Uh, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And these equations will say the radius and energy of an electron in each energy level. Okay, I'm going to do a quick example problem. So let's say I got an electron in the third energy level of hydrogen. What's its radius? What's its energy level? Oops, sorry, I just noticed that says an N of an electron. If you want to know its radius and its energy level, radius, 0 0.053 nanometers times N squared. So you just do 0 0.053 times N squared. Third energy level, N equals 3, which is 0 0.053 times 9. That's the radius. You want to know the energy of an electron in that energy level? The energy is negative 13.6 EV over n squared, or negative 13.6 EV over 3 squared, where 3 squared is still 9. That's the energy. Now, I started the bull bit talking about a, a spectra. And the question is, why did he believe this was true? And why do we still believe it to be kind of mostly true? Once again, I will get to the full truth. The reason why he first said this, and the reason we believe it, is it matched the spectral emission lines. You see, according to Bull, electrons only exist at discrete radii. And if something switches energy levels, energy must be conserved. That if you move an electron to a higher energy level, you have to add energy. And you can add energy either with fire or electricity or light. And the emission spectra was we shot of electricity into something and we saw set spectrums of lines. Well, what he said is, hey, Einstein said each electron has an energy of HF. I, if I say each electron has an energy of HF, I can relate each color light in the emission spectrum to a set amount of energy. And that set amount of energy matched a change in energy levels. You see, if you excite an electron, if you put energy into an electron, the electron jumps to a higher energy level. The, ener the, the thing is the electron does not want to be at a higher energy level. And so once the electron is excited at the higher energy level, it's gonna turn around and say, what the hell am I doing here? Screw this, I'm going home. And the electron will relax back down. When the electron relaxes back down, each time one electron relaxes, it'll produce one photon. And the energy of that photon will be the change in energy levels. That if something goes from the fifth energy level to the third energy level, the photon will have an amount of energy equal to the energy level at the fifth minus the energy level at the third. And that was the realization, is that the emission spectral we talked about was some electrons relaxing when going from a higher energy level to a lower. Now, keep in mind, this is important. If one electron relaxes, it produces one photon. If 10 electrons relax, it produces 10 photons. If 100 electrons relax, it produces 100 photons. The number of photons has nothing to do with the energy level change. If one electron goes from five to one, one photon. If one electron relaxes from five to four, one photon. If one electron relaxes from five to three, one photon. 
every electron will be one photon, but the energy of that photon, which we view as the color of that photon, as you can see in this GIF I'm doing here, will be decided by what the change in energy is. And since only certain energy levels are allowed, that means only certain photons will be emitted. And he said, using the E equals HF, that the spectrum people saw when they excited hydrogen, that matched the energy of an electron relaxes from 5 to 2, 4 to 2, 3 to 2, and 6 to 2, respectively. I forgot 6 to 2 at the beginning that when electrons relax at those wavelengths, you see these lines because that's the change in the energy levels. Uh, that's called the BAMO series because it was discovered by BAMO. Um, you would think we'd look at the things when they relax to the first energy level, but the reason we don't is because the Lyman series, when you relax to the first energy level, is all ultraviolet and therefore not visible to the naked eye. Any questions though? Okay, we're going to stop there, and I will pick up on this on Wednesday, where I'm only going to make it more complicated. Please let me know if you need help. I will gladly, if you're not in the room and you're doing this by YouTube, shoot me emails, come to office hours. I'd love to help. This gets weird. Other than that, have a good day.